And here we are. Welcome back. Um, so uh, the plan for today is to uh, lay out the foundations of uh, uh, partially observable Markov decision processes so that tomorrow in the tutorial, we will see how to solve one specific example that is uh, the problem of Bernoulli bandits in a Bayesian setting, okay? So uh, let me just uh, uh, recap uh, the ideas and uh, uh, objectives for, uh, for today and tomorrow, at least. Um, so uh, as you remember from, from the very beginning, uh, any reinforcement learning problem can be cast in uh, the notion of an agent interacting with an environment. And uh, with a closed loop interaction, which is made of actions and percepts. And the percepts are actually uh, split into a couple of a pair of objects, three words, and observations. So rewards are the part of the percept which pertain to the goal, okay? We construct our goal starting from rewards and observations give contextual information, okay? So uh, in general, uh, observations are limited. So uh, uh, the state of the environment is often unknown. It's hidden to the agent. The agent has some knowledge about its environment, about the context only through partial observations. So uh, in general, uh, so this is in very general setting in the reinforcement learning, uh, what the agent has uh, in its own uh, availability uh, is a series of actions, rewards, and observations. So uh, in general, at time T of this uh, uh, loop of interaction with the environment, uh, the agent uh, uh, has performed a series of actions. So starting from the initial time, uh, it has performed action A node. Uh, and then this has resulted in a reward R1, okay, maybe a random object, uh, and an observation uh, Y1. Okay, so this Y1 can be a, a high dimensional object. So observations could be images of the environment, could be long lists of uh, variables, uh, temperature, pressure, uh, whatever, degrees of freedom of my uh, physical system uh, with the uh, N particles, okay? It can be a very large object, the observation, okay? So this is the observation and this is the reward. The reward in turn is just a one dimensional object, a real variable, could even be this. Here we're discussing always discrete approximations in order to make uh, the, uh, the notation uh, clearer and the algorithms clearer, but the problem, general problem of reinforcement learning generically address the situation where these objects are real. Uh, and then after that, uh, a new action is taken, which may and should depend on the previous things that have happened. And then uh, another sequence of rewards and action lists until we say that at time t minus one, we receive the couple. So the, the question is uh, how to choose according to some time dependent policy in general, uh, how to choose the next action given all this string of observations, which we may call a history. And we may call it h less than t. Okay, there's just a symbol to say everything that has happened before time t. Or another notation for that could be h of everything that has happened from time zero to time t. Whatever, these are just notations to, 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 to compress the, the notation for a, for a long string of uh, uh, objects. 
So in general, the problem of reinforcement learning is to find out what are the best mappings between histories and decisions, given that we want to achieve a certain goal. And, and in general, the goal is, is to maximize over these choices of policies, the expected value of, for instance, the sum, okay? This is one of the possible goals in the future of uh, the rewards times t plus one, okay? So here I'm putting all the randomness that I can have. So random rewards, okay? So this is the, the general task, which is extremely complex in itself, right? So uh, uh, here we, we face a uh, first uh, dichotomy between two possibilities. Uh, the first possibility is that uh, we do not have a model available, okay? So we have to rely on this long record of histories. Okay, so first option, no model. And then we have just to take these long histories and then sort of process them somehow, compress them, put them into some memory, okay? So that the idea is that uh, in this loop of operations, uh, uh, the history, uh, say at time t is somehow compressed into some smaller set of variables, these memory states, okay? You might think that you have a uh, just a physical memory of a computer in which you, instead of having these exponentially large records, you just uh, somehow compress them by some method or, uh, I don't know, erase everything, just like a stack memory, erase everything that was happened uh, be 10 steps uh, before or, uh, you just filter out something. So any kind of processing that compresses your information and puts it into a memory. And then from the memory, you decide what to do about your action, okay? So this is one, one possible way to go. And uh, this is the kind of things that we will explore next. But for now, we are concerned on in the second option where a model is there. Okay, so we are talking about decision-making, which is model-based. What does it mean in practice for us? Well, it means that uh, we know that there is an underlying Markov decision process. So we know that the states in our environment depend on the actions in the previous states in a Markovian manner. We know how the rewards depend on this triplet of actions. But states are hidden to our knowledge. Okay, states are hidden, which means that instead of states, we have to use your observations. And these observations, for instance, might depend on our current or subsequent state. It doesn't matter. It's just a matter of notation or the definition. Uh, so we, we have this which is, we call a model of the observations. So if these three things are known, what we can hope for is to be able still to plan in the future, accounting for the fact that we don't observe the, the system itself. Okay, so why is this a, is this a challenge? Uh, so in order to fix the ideas, uh, but again, I insist that all the treatment is rather generic. It applies to any kind of uh, uh, system. Let's, uh, let's fix the ideas on a, on a specific example. And the specific example is the state, two state mark of decision process. Okay, so we have two states and just two actions. Okay, so I can put names to these actions, but doesn't really matter here. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, these actions uh, can have, uh, of course, only two possible outcomes. Uh, so either they send the system in itself or send it, uh, the state in itself or send it to the other state. 
Okay, and for each of these arrows, there are uh, probabilities and rewards issued. Okay, so as as usual in this notation, this would be the probability of going in two, even though the previous state was two, and that the action taken is one, and this will issue a reward as the previous state two, action one, new state two. Okay, so these are S A S prime. S prime, S P. Okay, and for each of those, you have this labeling of the arrows uh, depending on what they give. Okay, uh, so if you have this system as an MDP, you know now know all the machinery, all the uh, uh, weapons that uh, that uh, you have at your disposal in order to solve this problem. Okay, you know all this. Uh, quantities so you can uh, make uh, uh, planning that use dynamic programming and for instance you end up uh, with the uh, final result that uh, your best action from uh, two is one and your best action from one uh, is two okay just let's let's assume this okay there is some structure in the, these probabilities and these rewards that makes it the problem such that uh, the best action uh, uh, from state two is one and the best action from state two from state one is two okay uh, and now <clears throat> I, I want to introduce partial observability. Uh, which means that uh, I am not able at, as an agent at each step to know whether the system is in state two or in state one. So what I have instead is an observation at each time. So there is another variable y and it can take, for instance, values one or two. Okay, and this variable, <clears throat> loosely speaking, is a, a, a measurement of the state, but a measurement which can be noisy. What do I mean by that? Uh, I mean that uh, I, I'm now introducing, for instance, this very simple. Uh, so let's say that the probability of having an observation y uh, given s is uh, like this. Okay, so first. If S equals one, I have Y equals one with probability one minus epsilon and Y equals two with probability epsilon. So what does that mean? It means that if my system is in state one, I use some device to measure in which state I am. And this device tells me with probability one minus epsilon that I am in one, which is correct. But with some probability epsilon, it makes some error of measurements and says me incorrectly tells me, okay, you're in state two. Okay. So this error probability is something that I know. So I know how errors happen in my measurement device. And given this knowledge that I have a model of the observation, in fact. I want nonetheless be able to control my system to find out which are the best decisions to make, even in presence of this uncertainty. Is it conceptually clear so far? Any questions? Okay. Please stop me at any time if you have. Uh... I'm sorry, I have a very, very small uh, thing about uh, the before, uh, the part before, about the notation of history. When uh, you wrote yeah. H from zero to T. Yes. Uh, is that right? Is that from zero to T? Because uh, when we're evaluating the policy at time T, we are taking uh, all the history until T minus one. Okay, I see what you mean. You're right. I should, uh, to be consistent, I should put T minus yeah, one. Just, you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're totally right. Thank you. No, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have another question. Yes, please. Yeah, we used to say that uh, Markov decision process is a memoryless process. But now we are introducing this notion of history, which is affecting how we are choosing our state. Yeah, right. Because that's exactly the point. Because when we have partial observability, we need to move out from the Markovian. Okay. So there is a system underlying which is Markovian. But uh, since we do not observe the states themselves, we just observe some projection of the state space, if you wish. Then we have to deal with the fact that uh, our, our decision making will not be Markovian. We'll have to rely on history. So the example that you must keep in mind is the example of the uh, carton pole, right? So if you have access only to positions and angles, 
you need to rely on the history in order to be able to control the system. That's just the same idea, okay? And your system, of course, your, your cart pole system in the coordinates uh, X and theta is not Markovian because it's not enough to know what is what the position is in order to predict the future, all right? Okay. So these are all very good points and uh, I'm happy you, uh, you react on these conceptual issues. Uh, all right, so, and the same happens for state two, uh, only the situation is reversed. Uh, uh, it makes the same error, it could be different errors, it doesn't really matter. I mean, this is just to, to, to fix the ideas. Uh, sorry, I'm writing the same thing again, which is not what I wanted. Okay. Uh, okay, this sounds, sounds reasonable. Uh, what is the problem now? Well, the problem is that uh, uh, how do I decide? If I not, don't know the states, how do I decide? I'm, I might solve my MDP problem, which tells me if you are in state two, choose action one. If you are in state one, choose action two. But if, I, if I'm not sure about what state I'm in, what should I do? Okay. So the intuitive idea is that, okay, uh, I have had some observations so far, and these observations are actually telling me something where I am, right? Even if not with certainty. If I end up, uh, uh, I, I know the model. If epsilon is very small, uh, and, I, and I receive an observation one, or a series of observations one, I can be pretty confident that I am in state one, okay? So how do I formalize this idea that the observations are telling me something about the states, even though I don't observe them directly? If I can manage to formalize this idea of inferring the current state from the series of past observations, if I can perform this inference step, then I can decide, I can control, I can plan. That's the underlying idea, okay? Very good. So that's what we're gonna set ourselves to for today. Defining the formal framework, which uh, integrates the notion of sequential inference. So inferring states from observations with decision-making. So uh, just to sketch the uh, conceptual uh, plan for today, let's just, uh, uh, Review us some 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 very basic uh, uh, description of what the problem is. Uh, so uh, a Markov decision process. Okay, uh, broadly speaking, uh, is a controlled Markov chain. Okay, so you have a Markov chain that is a process which goes from one state to another. And you have a series of parameters, which is the policy, which lead you to control this Markov chain. Okay, just like you have a dynamical system and you have some forces over which you act in order to steer your system in your direction or the other. Now, what we're gonna introduce now uh, in the following are partial, partially observable MDP. Okay, so that, that's our goal. So what are they? Well, they are controlled hidden Markov chains. Okay. So that's the parallelism. In the first case, you had a Markov chain and you wanted to control it. Now you have a hidden Markov chain. There is a Markov underlying Markov process which you cannot observe directly, but you observe indirectly. And you want to control this hidden Markov process. Is that clear? Does it make sense? Okay. So in order to set the stage, let's work with the hidden Markov chains first. Okay. So hidden Markov chains are also known as hidden Markov models, which is uh, an acronym that uh, you might have uh, encountered. And which have widespread applications, of course. It's, uh, it's, it, as you can realize, all the things that we are discussing are, are extremely general, okay? So what's the idea of a hidden Markov model? So again, here there is no control. So the, the general idea is that uh, uh, 
there is a some system, some Markov system. So there is a system which uh, uh, evolves in time according to some transition probability. So there is a, some transition probability from one state to another. You see that there are no actions yet here. So we are not controlling the system. It's something which it's evolving of its own accord according to some P, which we know. This is known. This is the model of the environment without the actions. Uh, and at each time step, okay, for simplicity, uh, we receive some observation about the system. Okay, so in our previous example here of the two state, it's just like you had a, a system which is jumping from one state to another according to some probability. Okay, let me revise it here for uh, uh, just like. Now there is no control, so there are no actions. The system can only do like this or that, this or that with some probabilities, okay? So this is, for instance, is probability of two, two. This is probability of going two given one, P one given two, P one given two, okay? And all, all these quantities are known. But what is known? Sorry about the okay. Uh, and what is what is not known here is the states themselves. Okay, so we like before we make observations which can be error prone. So at every time we we get a one or a two which might or might not be exactly the current state we are in. In the limit where the error probability is one half, we get random sequences of numbers, which means that we we are not actually observing anything. Okay, so we can go with this epsilon from a situation where we have absolutely no information about the system, about the state, or to a situation where we have per perfectly no at each time in which state we are. Okay, so uh, like I said, a, a very important and relevant piece of information would be to identify the probability of being in a certain state at time t given the previous history of observations. Okay, so is the notation clear here? By this, I mean a shorthand for observation at time zero, observation at time one, observation at time t minus one. So this is gonna be very useful because as I collect information about the system, I might be able to localize my probability around a certain state. And if I have this knowledge, of, at least in a probabilistic sense of where my system is sitting at a given time, I can formulate some sort of uh, uh, decision-making problem, okay? So uh, the technique that we are gonna use now, just to make a connection with, maybe you, you have encountered this before, is goes under the name of Bayesian updating. Okay, so if you have already heard about it, we are gonna just revisit this subject from the specific viewpoint of Markov, the hidden Markov models. Uh, if, you are, if you are new to the subject, never mind, we will go through this in, uh, in detail, okay? So the, the key object we are looking uh, for is this, is this one. So now we're gonna go through this, a series of steps slowly in order to derive a rule which allows us to construct sequentially these probabilities, okay? So the basic idea is that as the system evolves in time, At every step, we can incorporate sequentially new observations as they come and update our current probability over states. That's the goal. So in order to do so, we, we just go a little step at a time. So um, what is this probability here? Okay, but well, let's go by steps. So here I'm just rewriting. Uh, so um, yeah, sorry. Maybe for just for 
allow me to do uh, Allow me to do just a, a slight modification. Sorry for this, but let me just define this uh, 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 up to time t. Maybe no. just use a round parenthesis instead of a square parenthesis on the right. So you it's prefer, like an interval. You prefer a square uh, round parenthesis? No, no, no. I was, was suggesting just like an interval, you know, that you include the zero. Yeah, you yeah. The I'm two. using squares because uh, this is the customary notation for uh, discrete uh, intervals. But uh, okay, I mean, he, uh, so uh, the uh, okay, this means that I'm just evaluating the probability of uh, being in, uh, in this state uh, after I make the observations. Okay, this is just uh, one step. Uh, a shift with the previous one. You can find both of them in the literature, doesn't really uh, change the, 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 the substance, okay? Uh, so, uh, so what is this thing? Okay, just by definition, uh, this is also, if I marginalize over all the possible states up to time t minus one, so I sum over all the sequences So I sum over all possible previous states uh, of the probability of the sequence from zero to T given the observations from zero to T. Okay. So this is just, I'm saying, I'm focusing only on uh, the probability of the current state. Um, I don't care now about what the previous states were given my information. In general, Bayesian updating deals with more complex objects. So you can reconstruct pieces of history, whatever. But here we focus only on, given the history, I want to know where I am now, or I want to infer where I am now. Okay, so is this notation clear? Uh, this sum uh, below here means that I'm uh, summing over S0, S1, S2, S T minus one. Let me make it even more explicit in the, in the corner. So. For future reference, this corresponds by definition as sum over S0, sum over S1, sum over S T minus one. So this is I'm just I'm just uh, writing this marginal, the marginal here as a, an explicit integration over all uh, uh, variables that I'm not caring about. So why do I do that? Well, because now I can use uh, the uh, definition of a conditional probability. Uh, which tells me that this object is also equal to, uh, uh, to the sum over all previous states of the joint probability Just definition of conditional probability now applied to a string of values. Again, nothing happening here, just uh, simple manipulations of the prob property of uh, probability distributions. So why, why did I want to get to this uh, 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 ugly object here? Uh, because now I can use the Markov property of my system. Okay, so I can write the joint probability distribution of uh, states and observations as a long product, okay? So this object here at the denominator, let's, uh, sorry, the numerator, let's isolate it for a second. Okay, so let's isolate this term here and write it down explicitly. So the probability of a, a string of states and observations, what is it? Well. First and foremost, there is the initial state, okay? So you see how the process works. At the very beginning, you have a state, then you make an observation, then you jump to another state uh, and you make another observation, okay? And uh, here I didn't plot it, but it's worth putting here that what is governing here is the probability distribution of the y given s, All right? So let's start from the first uh, item. And first and foremost, there is my uh, 
probability distribution, let's call it raw node of my initial state. I have to start somewhere, and this is my distribution over the states uh, at the initial time. Uh, then I make an observation, which I'm going to call y0, as a, and this depends on the state s0. And then I make a transition to a new state s1, given s0. And then I make an observation f y1 in state one one, and so on and so forth. So there is this long product uh, of uh, transitions until I get to state t from state t minus one, and I make observation yt from state st. So this is where I use the Markov property of my underlying process. The, these probabilities are all products of probabilities and all observations are independent. That's what I'm using here. So uh, this is interesting and useful because uh, this allows me to, to rewrite uh, this object uh, in the following way. So I can isolate what is what has happened at the last step. And therefore, this is also equal to the probability of everything that has happened until the previous time, e minus one. Times the last step. Okay. Everything plain. Here I I started using assumptions about my system. That is the Markovianity. Very good. So now what I'm gonna do here is uh, I'm gonna use this object and replace it. Uh, uh, in the, in the numerator. But before that, I have to manipulate a little bit also the numerator. Sorry, I'm mixing up the denominator. Yeah. So, which is nothing but the marginal over the states of what I have up above. Okay. So I'm going to do the same trick here. So the probability of the sequence of observations up to time t is just the, the marginal over all sequence of states of the joint probability okay again nothing to be seen here uh, just marginalization but then I, I use this uh, factorization property above this one. And I can split this sum uh, below here into the sum over the previous history. And the sum over the last step of what? Of the probability, joint probability over Okay, this one, this last step is coming from, from here. Times probability of st, st minus one. Okay, uh, now I can pull out this, this sum uh, this, this probability here, I can pull it out from the sum over ST because it doesn't depend on ST on the last time. And uh, I can marginalize. So this becomes uh, uh, the probability over the previous sequence of observations. So sum over S, sum, okay, this one. Times the sum over st of p over st. So again, this is not surprising. Since 
my my last observation depends only on the last state. All right. Uh, sorry, here um, uh, sorry here I forgot one thing. So let me just rewrite it properly. Uh, sorry. Uh, Uh, yeah, the sum is still on over there. So I have to write this properly as sum over S. So I have the probability of the conditional. Uh, the histories, yes. Yeah. This one. Then I have the probability of y zero t minus one, and then I have the probability of s t. Okay, that's this. This one is correct. Uh, so. This object here is the one which uh, uh, can go out uh, uh, of the sum. Uh, and here, uh, this sum is further split into the sum over states until t minus two, the sum over s t minus one, the sum over s t. And then I repeat this, so let me here. So this object is goes out of the sum. And then I have this object here. And this history, I can split it into the past, the last one conditioned on the observations until time zero t minus one and this is times okay fine now i can uh, uh, sum over the histories until time t minus two here and finally end up with this Okay, so uh, it's a sort of lengthy and a little bit cumbersome uh, uh, operation, but I hope the spirit is clear is that you, by this fact that the process is Markovian, you can peel out the last thing that is happening and sum over all the things that happen first and to isolate. So the, the, uh, the understanding of this formula is that, remember where we started from. We started from this. What is the probability of, of making a sequence of observations up to time t? Well, this is telling me, uh, it's this, the probability of making observations up to time t minus one, this term. And then given that sequence of history up to time t minus one, there is a conditional probability of being in state s t minus one, which is this world object. And given this conditional probability, I will jump to state s t and make observation y t according to this formula. Okay, so I am unrolling all the conditional uh, probabilities in this scheme. And so if I take this and I combine it with the green formula above, okay, look here, I have this term here at the numerator. I have this term here at the denominator, which will give me the condition of probability of the past history with respect to the observations. Okay. So when I combine the green and the yellow terms 
together, what do I get? Well, I get, so I'm resuming from here. Excuse me, can I, can I make a question? Sure, just, yeah, please. In the orange uh, passage that we made, from the yeah. first one to the second one, we wrote the same stuff, but we added a new probability of uh, y from zero to t minus one. And yes. I didn't. Yeah, yeah, because uh, it's, it's not, I mean, it's not the same thing. It's just this object here, we are using the fact that exactly this formula both, the green formula here. Yes. So we are using, we're writing this as the product of what has happened until t minus one times the last step. Yes. And then this is sum over zero and t, we split it into the sum between zero and t minus one and the sum over st. Is that what? what yes, but now in the um, following one. passage, we are wrote, writing the same, is the same as above, but we added that p of y, yeah, we just, um, here we're just saying that the, the joint probability of states and observations is the probability of states conditional on observations times the probability of observations. Ah, it's a condition. Okay, I didn't. Yeah. Okay, it's okay. just a conditional probability definition. Okay, okay. Sorry. Sure. No, no, it's okay. I mean, it's, uh, it's very good if you ask uh, specific questions about the passages. Actually, I have another question. Yes, please. In the last passage, we are like erasing uh, um, the reference to s from zero to uh, t minus two, and I didn't. Yeah, we are why. summing over all possible occurrences. Yes. Okay. We are not erasing. We are actually performing the sum here. So if you look at the, this sum here, this is the probability over the last step. The sorry, the La, yes, last step t minus one and all the previous steps. But now we are summing all of them, so we're taking the marginal. So this object here uh, okay. is the marginal of the one here. So, okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so um, yeah, there's a lot, but uh, you can you can review that uh, individually, or you can ask me questions. Uh, I'm very happy to. Uh, guide you through the details, but the basic take home message is that we're just using properties of probabilities, that is con how conditional probabilities are defined, how marginally probabilities are defined, and we are using the Markov structure of the problem. That's, there's no other ingredient we are putting into the game at this stage. Okay. I'm sorry, I have another question about Please. that, but the a little bit up, what is that notation as in the uh, penultimo passaggio, where there is a p s from zero to t minus two, and then uh, like yeah. the product s t yeah. minus one is just for isolating the. Yeah, yeah, it's just that to say that. Uh, uh, so let me make it a little bit more explicit here. Um, okay, so what I mean by this, remember that by definition. No, uh, in, in the in the top right corner now it is where, where you wrote uh, the, the s from uh, zero t a little bit uh, down. Yeah, yeah. No, let me let me just explain it because it's from here to it's from here to here that you want to know what happened. Yeah, right. No, I want to know exactly what is that notation where you have the pointer now. Yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm about to explain. Uh, so this object here. Let me let's just take one step back. This object here is. Uh, state zero is the sequence, right? State zero, state one, up to state t minus one. This is the definition. Okay. What I'm doing here is just that I'm, I'm writing this as a s zero, s t minus two, union s t. Okay. Yeah. So that's just a way to represent yeah. the the sequence with the, the element uh, isolated. Like, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Like string okay. has become a uh, a big string plus one item, okay? Now, thank you for asking so everything is uh, transparent. All right, so that, that's where we were. Uh, mm, this means that we have to combine these two things together. And if we do that, we, I just take, take it back from, uh, uh, from here. It's 
the sum of states from zero to t minus one. And then the green part above is this one. It's the joint, joint, was it joint? Yes, it's joint. Probability of this time is zero to t minus one. Observations from zero to t minus one times, uh, for God's sake, this is awful, okay? Times uh, the observation of the ST, and the transition of ST plus one and ST. Okay, so this is the numerator. Sorry for the ugly use of space. Uh, um, yes, the green part and the numerator is uh, this uh, object here, so it's P sorry, I'm struggling to, to let this thing fit into uh, space properly. This clearly shows that this object is not a blackboard. Okay, so this probability of Y Okay, so I'm just copying from above. And then we're almost done here because there are the two last steps to be taken. Uh, the, again, it's always the same uh, kind of uh, game we're playing. So let's uh, collect this one with this one. Okay, so this is the ratio of a joint probability to a marginal probability. So it's a conditional probability. So this means that I have some yes, history up to time t minus one, probability of condition. Times the transition, times the observation, Divide I here I just what is left from the denominator as T S T minus one. Okay. Uh, and then again, very last step. This sum here, I'm gonna split it once more into the sum over S from zero to T minus two and the sum over S T minus one. Yeah. Yeah. And then this first sum here, I can marginalize, good. Just like I did before, I sum over everything that has happened before time t minus one now. So this allows me to get to the final formula, which is sum over states at time t minus one of the probability of states t minus one, given the history until time t minus one times the transition probability times, okay, while I'm writing, I realized that I mixed up T plus one and T here. Okay. Uh, and this is divided by sum over ST 
sum over s t minus one of the same object. And we're done, okay? We're done because we have to go a long way back up to say what was on the left-hand side of that all. Well, on the left-hand side of it, we had the probability of, of being in state ST given the history up to time T, okay? So all these things is equal to the probability of being in state ST given the history given the history from zero to t, okay? So why are we happy now? Well, because this gives us a sequential rule to update our probabilities. If I have my probability of being in a certain state given the history of observations up to that time, I have it here and I have it here. I can combine it with my probability of transitions and with my probability of observations to get the new updated probability. Okay. So I can go along with time sequentially. If I start out with a certain probability distribution over states, I will include my new observation and so on and so forth. But what is, it, what is this? Well, this is essentially Bayes' formula. So this is the essence of Bayes. So what is the difference here? Okay, so let's let's try and recognize what the terms are and what the difference are with the mo most most uh, familiar Bayes' formula that you that you might have. Uh, so this is what I would call the posterior at time t. This object here. And this one here would be the posterior at the time t minus one. And this thing here is the likelihood. You can read anything here. So the only new thing with respect to the usual Bayes formula is that now you have this term. So summarizing, if at any time you have a probability of a state given the observations up to time, let's see, so given time t minus one, you have this probability, okay? You can use your knowledge of the model P and F to derive the new updated probability given the new observations. So just to make things more familiar to you, let's consider one simple case that is, uh, if the transition probability is just the identity. So your underlying Markov system is actually not changing states. It's always sitting on the same state. If you are in this situation, you see that these sums here, okay, you can, you can make them explicitly because this object is an identity. This probability distribution here is an identity. So in this case, this is an example. Let me make it a 
remark. So in this case, what do the, your formula become? Well, your formula just becomes the probability of being in the state S. Now there's just one single state, so I don't even have to put a time index because it's always the same state. Given the sequence of observations up to time T is just the probability of that state, given the previous sequence of observations, times the likelihood of the last observation given the state divided by the sum over s. So this is the most probably you, you all are familiar with this version of the base formula. Yes, priors, likelihoods, Below you have what is called the evidence, which is the normalizing factor for the numerator, okay? So what has changed here is the fact that uh, since the system can change from one state to another, your prior also moves in state space, okay? So if you are 99% sure that uh, at a certain time you are sitting in state two, and your model says now you're going to make a transition to one, then your belief will move with you. Okay, so if you are sure that you were in state two and your model tells you now you jump to state one, then now you're sure that you are in state one. Okay, so this expresses the fact that uh, there are two competing uh, parts in uh, the way that beliefs are updated. So as beliefs, okay, uh, posterior for the moment. Posterior updates are made of two steps. First, likelihoods. So likelihoods increase our information about the state. So useful observations will tend to shrink our, our posterior distribution, okay? So the more we know, the more the belief shrinks. But then we have also the transport of belief, uh, of likelihoods, of posteriors. Transport means that if states change, the posterior follow this change. And since the system is stochastic, this tends to spread out the posterior. So if you make a change from one state to another, but this change is stochastic, and so for, for instance, suppose that you are now with a very narrow posterior over state two. Okay, so you're quite sure that you're sitting on state two. But now your model sends you with probability 60% into state one and 40% on state two. Okay, so I am here in a situation where I have two states, one and two. And then I have a probability 0 0.4 of getting back here and 0 0.6 of being of going there. Now, even if my probability, my posterior of being here at a certain time t, given the previous history up to that time, is say 0 0.999, when I make this step, this will erase a lot of information. Because after this step, this transition step, basically I will know with probability 60%, approximately 60% if I am in state one, approximately 40% that I'm in state two. Okay. So in general, there is this competition between uh, observations that uh, increase information and the dynamics of my system, which tends to make it forget. Okay. Fine. So this notion of belief updating, which is uh, a glorified version of Bayes formula, which accounts also for uh, the underlying dynamics of the hidden Markov process, uh, is a, a key ingredient in what we're gonna do after the break. That is construct a theory for decision-making in presence of partial observability. Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I can, it is correct to write, maybe it's a mistake, I don't know, or maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Um, 
P of ST uh, given ST plus one in the last no, passage. No, not, yeah, you're right. It's uh, I've been uh, been mixing okay. plus and minuses. Thank you for thank you for noticing this. There might be other uh, uh, there might be other yeah there are other ones. Sorry. Yeah, thank you for pointing this out. When I when I will upload the the, the file, if you notice other misprints, uh, please let me know so I can correct them. Thank you for being so attentive. Um, I think that uh, uh, the C plus one comes from uh, the. Green Sorry, I can. Is, someone is speaking, but I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? No, uh, the volume is quite low, at least on my side. Could you please raise? Uh, now? No, not, it's not getting any better for me, at least, more for the others. OK, maybe now it's yeah, better. That, that's better, thank you. OK, yeah. I was saying that maybe the T plus 1 uh, came from the initial definition of uh, the green formula when we unrolled uh, all the terms. Maybe it was there. So I, I tend uh, to to say that the T plus one comes from the fact that I'm an old guy and I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm getting more and more Alzheimer over the days uh, in the sense that, no, it, it was meant, the confusion arises from the fact that uh, uh, in my mind from here, in the sense that you could take the step from T to T plus one or to take the step from T minus one to T. And if you mix the two together, that makes a mess. Yes, of so course. I, I tend to favor this hypothesis. <laughs> Okay. There, there should be no T plus one if I do everything correctly from uh, from the beginning to the end. So if you spot one, it's most likely a mistake of mine. Sorry, I want to ask something. I was re um, re reviewing uh, the files you gave us of the, this the whiteboard. whiteboard okay. Yeah. Um, I noticed that they are like uh, a bit blurred and you cannot distinguish well uh, what you wrote sometimes. So I was wondering if there is a way to make them more. Uh, yeah, I, I noticed that as well. I, I tried a couple of, uh, made a couple of attempts, but was not actually able to improve the resolution. I'm, a, I'm afraid that's oh, okay. of the program, but I, I will see if I can uh, do some post-processing to, to, to make them better. Yeah, thank I, you very I, will, much. I will try. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, I think it's uh, we, it's been a long ride, so let's take a break and uh, we reconvene, uh, say, 20 past 10. Sorry, can yeah. I make uh, another question sure, sure. if possible? Sure. Uh, I didn't understand what happened in the pink passage uh, in, during the, the passages. Uh, no, above. Okay, this one. Uh, this one? There's there's few pink ones. Uh, no, I think there's a bit of delay in the screen. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so, below. Below again. Is that one? Yes. Okay. So what I did here is uh, um, I, I repeated the same kind of things that I did earlier. So this sum here, uh, I split it into the sum until time t minus two and the time and the sum over t, t minus one, which is uh, this. Is that this first part okay? And the second part okay. is that this history again, uh, I'm doing the same thing that I did uh, above again in, uh, in uh, uh, in pink, which I I notice also there's uh, an error here. This is minus one. So uh, this whole sequence is you actually split it into the first part of the string and the last item. And here I'm doing the same thing up above. So I'm writing this object here as uh, s from zero to t minus two and s t minus one. And then 
what I do is basically now I'm using another color. Uh, this is bright yellow. So this part of the sum here, the yellow one, uh, I use it to sum over all the history before t minus two and included. So this will leave me just the dependence on this item here, which is the object which is here. So I'm marginalizing on overall states probabilities before t time t minus strictly before time t minus one. Is that any clearer? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, another thing uh, about uh, what we what we are taking into account uh, uh, from our past observation. Uh, why we didn't uh, take into account also the action that we that we made and uh, what happened? Right. Uh, so because, uh, like I said at, at the beginning, uh, we're going to do things one one at a time in the sense that for the moment we start uh, uh, without control. Okay. So this is just a hidden Markov model uh, without control, and in the next part we're going to add the actions and everything. So the next step will be what happens if I make an observation and end an action, and I will combine these two things together. So you're perfectly right. At this first stage, just in order not to make the, it's already pretty cumbersome. Uh, so if I added also actions that it would have made it more complicated. So in my mind, it was a way to simplify and split the process. What happens without control? And now we add control. Does that okay. Make sense? okay. Yes, yes, thanks. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's make uh, 10, 25 then. See you later. Okay, like we are. Now we lay out uh, all the uh, ingredients to, to formally define what is a partially observable mark of decision process. Okay, so now just for a little while, I will just introduce this as at the level of definitions and then we will see how, how to work it out and what to do with it. So, uh, like I told you uh, earlier, a partially observable Markov decision process is an extension of the notion of a Markov decision process. So it should include the same ingredients as an MDP plus some others. And uh, some of the ingredients are already familiar to you. So there should be uh, states and actions. Okay, uh, a new thing with respect to the uh, mark of decision process is something that we've been discussing already extensively is that now we have another set of ob objects which are the observations. Or more generally, you can, may also think them uh, as the percepts if you want to include rewards, okay? So this could also be, uh, why could also be thought of uh, including uh, uh, rewards, just like, like rewards and the actual contextual observations uh, say home, okay? You can find both uh, definitions in the, in the literature. So rewards could be seen as uh, uh, informations about the state of the system themselves. So depending on how you formally define the system, you could think that rewards are functions of observations or you could have rewards and observations, doesn't really uh, matter what, what techniques, uh, what uh, actual definitions you use, the important is to, to keep in mind the concept. So then there are other things which are again, oh, sorry, which are again uh, um, customary from uh, MDP in the sense that you have your model for the environment that is uh, transition probabilities uh, from states to other states given actions. And you have your uh, average rewards. Uh, here you could generalize uh, a bit, but let's uh, keep uh, uh, the notation as close as possible to MDPs. Uh, so these are rewards, average. 
Uh, then, of course, since you have observations, you have to provide a model for observations as well. That is, uh, how do you expect how do you expect rewards to be distributed? Uh, uh, sorry, observations to be distributed uh, in probability. And uh, in uh, the specific case of MDPs, the notation that is used is the following. So the observations will be dependent on uh, the action you take, okay? And on the new state. So the state on which you land on. Again, uh, you could define them otherwise, depending on the previous state or depending on both states. This is the most used notation, so I will stick to that. But again, these are minor changes. Every problem can be mapped into another by suitable uh, uh, change of definitions. So you shouldn't be worried about it. This is uh, quite trivially the observation model. Good. So a new thing that we have to introduce at this stage uh, is the notion of the posterior, right? So we have seen so far that the posterior, you can see it as a way of encoding the history of observations. Okay. So in mathematical terms, you can actually show that the posterior is a sufficient statistic for the history, which means in uh, mathematical terms that all the information that is uh, accumulated in a, in a sequence of observations and actions is actually encoded in, into the belief. You're not losing any information by using the belief, sorry, the posterior, uh, rather than uh, the, the full history. So I'm repeating, repeatedly using the notion of belief because this is how posterior are called, priors and posteriors are called in uh, PMDP, okay? These are B of S, is called the belief and it is the probability distribution over states. We are going to routinely call these beliefs what you should keep in mind and these are the posteriors on the base updating, Bayesian updating. And in fact, this is made clear by the fact that we are given a rule how to update beliefs. Which is the following one. Let me write it and then we comment on it. So this object here is the updated belief, okay? So it's, if you wish, the posterior, given a certain action taken and a certain observation made. Okay, so my system goes from one state to another due to the some action. And in the, in the process, some observation is made. And as a result, I update my belief about my, where I am in state space which state am I, am I occupying at the current moment? And this is just a reflection of what we did in the previous hour. Uh, it's just uh, the likelihood of the observation at the new state, this object which I have introduced here. And then there is a sum over the previous belief, the prior, if you wish, which has been transported by my process and all this has to be normalized. So sum over S prime. So this is exactly the, the same formula that we wrote previously for Bayesian updating, only with a slight change of definitions and with the fact that we have introduced actions now. And now the key thing uh, is that in POMDPs, the policies, since we cannot define them as mappings from states to actions, are mappings from beliefs to actions. 
So a policy is a function from beliefs to actions. So by this B with a dot, I mean uh, the full vector of beliefs. Okay, so it's a function of the vector of beliefs. Okay, so this is a conceptual point which has to be extremely clear. So the idea of a, of a POMDP is that I start with some prior about where I am in state space. So for instance, in my two state model, I may say, okay, I start with 50% probability on each state. This is my prior. Then I have this policy, any given policy, which says, okay, for that belief, for that prior, you should pick action A with a certain probability. For instance, 50% for each action in our simple model. Then once you perform the action, you, in your mind, I mean, the decision maker in its mind says, okay, if I had this action, this would have led me to a belief P prime. And then in the new belief, what do I do? I again consult my policy and extract a new action A and so on and so forth. So that's what the idea is. So what is the goal? So the goal is the same, is maximize over the policy, the expectation of the discounted rewards. Whereby this, uh, I can make it even more explicit. So there's no confusion in what I write, but as I mean, So, but here there's one thing that has changed uh, with respect to the previous uh, uh, definition. I mean, formally, it's the same, but the important thing is that this average here, this expectation value is also over beliefs. So we are not averaging only with respect to the stochasticity of the process, like in an MDP, but we're also averaging about our beliefs about how we think, how we infer that we are distributed over states. So uh, since this is important, uh, uh, let's open a little bit the uh, parenthesis to, to see what, what this actually means, okay? So, Sorry, just, yeah. just can I ask you only one small thing before we go ahead? Before, when you were writing uh, the observations, you wrote that y is equal to r and, and uh, up, even oh. more up. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, I, I put an o here. Yeah, this is notation, it's a small o. Sorry. Okay, and what is that for? Okay, this, is, this means that uh, if you want, you can explicitly split uh, your observations into rewards and contextual observations. Okay. So okay. It's, uh, it's just to tell you that sometimes in the literature, if you happen to read the paper on PMDPs, you will find out this other kind of description. So, but it's just a sort of, a, the literature is not homogeneous about how to, to represent things. Some people say there are observations and rewards are functions of observations. Some of them, they say there are percepts which are a mix of rewards and contextual observations. So it's not, it's not very important, okay? But just to keep you aware that there might be slight differences in the, in the notation and definitions, okay? Okay, thanks. It's not something that, that is as crystallized as uh, for MDPs. So there might be slight variations in notation from one uh, approach to the other, but the substance is the same. So I don't want to get you too much confused about notations, but focus on the principles. Okay, okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so uh, just to make everything uh, absolutely transparent, let's see what this means in terms of averages over beliefs. Uh, starting out with the, uh, with the first terms in this sum, right? Uh, so this object here, uh, 
It's, uh, if I make it explicit, it's just expectation uh, at the beginning S0, A0, S1, plus gamma expectation of the reward, uh, S1, A1, S2, and so on and so forth, okay? So let's just write explicitly the first two terms in order to see where the beliefs come into play, okay? It's already clear at the level of uh, the first term. Uh, so how do I construct this average? So first of all, remember that there's, there's some stochasticity in the process itself. So uh, what this actual object means is that uh, I have a state, an action, and a new state. Uh, and then uh, how do I go from one to another? Well, uh, I have my policy A, which depends on the, my initial belief. And this is the first part where this object appears. Okay. Uh, and then I have the new state as prime, which depends on the model. And uh, 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 of course, here I have to sum over all possible actions that I can take with their own probability distribution with all, all possible outcomes. But I also have to sum over the S because I don't know where I am. So, and this is the second part where the belief appears. Okay. So you see what I mean explicitly by this average is that I am summing over my probability distribution over states which is given by my starting beliefs, my prior, and I pick an action according to that prior, and then I average over. Okay, so there's this important message here is that there is this additional level of averaging over uh, the belief distribution. And uh, at the second step, that's, that's pretty much the same, only that now you use your updated belief. So if I write it explicitly, this would be, Uh, I get to have some and then I, I will fill it in. So now I have always rewards, states, and actions. Uh, only that now my policy uh, is taken with respect to the new belief, uh, which depends on the action I took at the previous time. So uh, let's call this uh, A1 and this A0 and the observation I took uh, at uh, the previous time zero okay so this is the policy uh, and then i have my transition probability from s state and action uh, and then i had the probability with which my previous observation was made okay and then i have now my my belief uh, for the current state which again depends on the previous action and why. And here, uh, I think I have everything because I've summed over states, uh, actions, uh, uh, observations. So I have to sum over this. And uh, I also have, of course, the policy A0, A0. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff already coming into the game. So this object, you have to average over the belief at the second time, which depends on uh, the action you took. Okay, so it's a very intricate uh, sum, uh, which makes, of course, the problem uh, quite challenging at first sight. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, yep. The, the sum is over uh, epsilon zero. A zero S A S prime. The sum is over everything because you have to come up with a with something that doesn't depend on. Uh, so yes, prime, S prime, yes, yes, S prime here. Yeah. Okay, so this is a one if you wish. Okay, never mind. The, this this only the only purpose. These these expressions are clearly intractable as they are. So the only purpose of showing them is the fact that there is a, a dependence on the history through the beliefs of all these things that we are going to sum up into the future. Okay, so uh, now one could take the approach of facing this problem directly and trying to solve it. 
Luckily enough, uh, there is one important consideration that uh, saves our day. So that uh, rather than doing a, a ton of uh, analysis and uh, uh, writing down pages of formulae, uh, we just have to realize one fundamental thing. And this will lead us immediately on uh, the solution of how to solve a partial observable decision, micro decision process. Okay, now this is only con highly conceptual. So just stay with me and don't think about formulas or, or anything. It's just the idea which is important. Uh, so an MDP, as you know, lives uh, uh, in a space of states and uh, with actions that bring you from one state uh, to another, etc. Okay, so you've seen this already many times. Now, a POMDP lives in a new space, which is the space of beliefs. So the space of beliefs is a complicated object. We've been discussing this uh, when we were talking about uh, policy gradients. Uh, it's a, a combination of simplexes. Okay, so it's a very complicated high dimensional object which contains probability distributions. So this is a space of states which is something like a, a hyper tetrahedron in, uh, in the space of uh, states. Okay, so this is in, uh, immersed in, uh, it is immersed in uh, the real to the number of states and it's uh, the probability distribution over the space. So one belief is a point in this hyper tetrahedron. It's a vector which belongs to hyper tree. Okay, so uh, the first key observation is that uh, Bayesian updating, that is this formula here, is sending beliefs into new beliefs. So what is happening here is that after you make an observation, your system will jump into a new belief B prime. And this new belief here depends only on the action you took and the observation you made. And if there are several observations that can be made, this just means that you can jump into different points. As many points as observations there are, okay? So if you look closely at this thing, you realize that vision updating is a Markov process in the space of beliefs. So why is that? Because it depends only on the previous belief. The new belief depends only on the previous belief and it depends on something which is the action and probabilistically also the possible observations with some probabilities that you know about. So if you make a, just the conceptual effort of saying that let's replace states with beliefs. So let's replace the notion of a state with the notion of a probability over states. Okay, we are lifting to this uh, higher dimensional space, actually continuous space. Uh, this means that a POMDP actually is equivalent to an MDP in belief space. So 
The base updating, you can see it as a transition probability in belief space. So you could define a sort of a probability of having a new belief given the previous belief and the action. And your average rewards will be average rewards with respect to beliefs. So without working out all the details, uh, I, you just should take my word and then I, I will point you to references where, where this is explained uh, in full detail if you are curious. Uh, but you should, I hope I convinced you that working with partial observable Markov decision process is just uh, looking at an MDP in a much more complex space, which is the space of probability distribution over states. Where do, the, where do the two things come together? Well, the two things coincide when your observations are perfect. What does that mean? If you observe directly the state with certainty, what will happen is that your observations will bring you in the corners of this belief space. The corners of this belief space are certainty. You know that you are in state S. And in that case, this collapses back to an MDP. So this is the geometrical intuition that tells you that this is an extension and it's a proper extension. Now, if you replace algebraically the, pro the observation probabilities with the delta functions that says, okay, you are in that state, you just recover the mathematics of the MDP. All of this is lengthy, but uh, I hope you, you trust me. It, and if it's anything is not clear at the conceptual level, that's the right time to ask. If you don't believe me that I take it as a perfectly uh, good expression uh, of skepticism, but I can point you to all the calculations that prove that uh, what I'm saying to you is not uh, false. Okay. So what is the upshot of all this? The upshot is that there is a Bellman equation. We have just as much as we had a Bellman equation for the MDP, we can have, write down a Bellman equation for PMDP. Okay, so let's first write it down and then we comment on uh, how nice is it and uh, how horrible it is because it's both things at the same time. Okay. So bottom line, I'm gonna write it first and then we uh, discuss it. So the optimal value of what? Well, it cannot be the optimal value of a state. So it's an optimal value for a belief. The optimal value of any belief, which means if at any certain time I find myself with a certain belief about where I am in state space, I can compute what so the optimal gain that I can get in the future, given that belief. Again, remember, this is a problem of planning under uncertainty. So all of this is something which happens in the mind of the decision maker before even getting to know what kind of observations it, it will make. It's just planning. Okay, this is a little bit mind boggling, uh, but one has always to keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, and now you recognize that there are, the structure is extremely similar to the Bellman's equation you're familiar with. It's the maximum over actions. And here you would have uh, the probability distribution over new states and the sum over S prime. What changes here is that you don't know the states, okay? So you have also to put the beliefs here and sum over this belief. So this is the average transition over the beliefs. And, and then also what matters is that you have an additional term is that there are also observations to be kept into account. 
So you have to average over them as well. And this is also a term which is new with respect to the previous Bellman's equation. And then you have something which is uh, more familiar, that is Rs a s prime plus plus what plus gamma and here you have the value of the new state in the Bellman equation right but now it's not the new state it's the value of the new belief so it's v star of b prime given the action and the observation You see the structure is basically the same with the only difference that now we have uh, beliefs over which to average and observations over which transitions depend. But otherwise the structure is the same. The best thing I can do is the maximum between what I can do and then the next step, the instantaneous reward, plus gamma what I will do from that belief onwards. So. Therefore, this means that in principle, you could use value iteration to solve it. And here I put immediately a question mark because here comes the bad news is that if an MDP, if the Bellman's equation for an MDP, you might remember, uh, amounts to finding a fixed point for a vector because the value function is a vector. Now the value function is a function and the Bellman's equation is a functional equation. Okay. So B, the belief is a, is a vector and the value function is a function of a vector. And this is an, Bellman becomes a nonlinear functional equation. And nonlinear functional equations are uh, hell or heaven, depending uh, on your tastes. Uh, mathematicians might thrive uh, and uh, uh, practitioners of computer science might die. Uh, so, in fact, you can uh, prove by complex uh, mathematical arguments that uh, the level of complexity of solving this equation is in a class which is called the P space. You might have heard about uh, uh, P non P complete problems. This is P space complete, which is entirely in another championship. Okay completely a different uh, content, contest. So in general, this is a super hard problem to solve. Except, except in some very favorable situations. What are these favorable situations? Well, first and foremost, uh, the key step is here is that you have to know how to update the beliefs, okay? So, if there, are, if there is any situation in which the, the belief updating is simple, maybe you, can, you are able to simplify your problem. So now I'm asking you a last effort to sort of try and sample you and ask you, uh, do you know of any example where this operation of belief updating, which is made here, forget about the actions, just base formula. Do you know about situations where you where the base formula is simple to iterate, where you can go from prior to posterior easily? There are some conditions that allow you to do that efficiently. Any suggestion? You you must rely on some structure. It's not something that you always do easily, but it, there are some specific cases in which this task is, is doable. I don't remember what, how it's called, but maybe it's when uh, uh, you combine posterior and likelihood and you have a known distribution from which you can sample. Yeah, great, great. 
the name that is uh, uh, that is that, that is slipping is uh, when there are conjugate priors. Yes, sorry, I forgot about so, it. <laughs> there is a whole class of probability distributions which have this nice property. For instance, just to name one, uh, Gaussians and Gaussians. If the likelihood is Gaussian and the prior is Gaussian, the posterior is Gaussian. How is this good news? Well, this is good news because you don't need to use now the full space of probability distributions. It's enough to look at the space of uh, the sufficient statistic of this distribution. That is, just look at means and averages. So this is a great dimensionality reduction of your problem. Of course, it works only when it works, only when your underlying model has the nice properties. This is one example. Another example, if your likelihood is Bernoulli, so it's just zeros and ones, coins and head. What is the what is the prior, the conjugate prior? Anyone remembers by heart? <laughs> it is binomial. No, not quite. So the binomial is another distribution. So if you if you start from a binomial, you will not end up uh, uh, with a binomial. I think it's the beta distribution. It's the beta distribution, right? Yeah. Exactly. So if you start out with the beta distribution, which is a distribution over numbers, real numbers between zeros and one, and you have a likelihood which is binomial, then you end up with a beta function. Okay. Actually, the family is much larger than this in the sense that there, if the prior is in the exponential family, which encompasses these examples and others, then the posterior is also an exponential family if the likelihood has a certain properties. Okay, so you can create a large class. Large, but not doesn't cover all probability distributions. Okay, so still this situation. Remember, it's non-generic. So in general, solving the the Bellman equation for PMDPs is a hard task. Now there are algorithms that now are doing very well, but they are sort of combining uh, sort of uh, mm, heuristic ideas with uh, direct solving. So, and just to, to mention the kind of ideas that uh, that you need is that remember you want to do sort of a value iteration sorry where i am i am here no. so you want to do value iteration in this space of uh, continuous space okay so uh, one thing that you could try that doesn't work is to just to uh, discretize the space it doesn't work because the space is too large that you fail so you can do other things like uh, for instance, trying to find out uh, relevant uh, points by pre-sampling the space. Uh, so it, there are so many sorts of inter interesting and smart tricks that allow you to get uh, approximate solutions of this, uh, of this problem. But this is something which is really sort of current literature, okay? So we're not uh, spending much time on that. But what we are gonna do instead tomorrow is to apply this kind of framework to the two-arm Bernoulli problem. Okay, so the two-arm Bernoulli problem is very nice because the transition probabilities are simple. The, the state is always the same, which simplifies the problem. And this means that we just have to use the usual base rule. And then the coins are Bernoulli. So we know that if we start with a beta distribution, we end up with a beta distribution. So what we will see tomorrow is that this space of beliefs, which is a, a nasty high dimensional space uh, continuous, becomes a discrete space for the two arm Bernoulli problem. And we can use value iteration to solve exactly the Bayesian bandit. Okay. So that's, that's the plan for tomorrow. So if you want to read more about, if you want to read more about this, uh, a good reference is a, a review paper by uh, Span. Uh, I remember, how, I, maybe it's two authors, but uh, uh, yeah, and uh, the paper is uh, partially observable. Marco Desimbos. I will post it in the Slack channel soon after we end up the lecture. Okay. So there you will see the, all these kind of things laid out and some uh, uh, algorithms to solve uh, uh, 
PMDPs uh, for finite horizon, for instance, this is something which was sort of a classical approach. This, these are easily become very, very complicated in the general case. But tomorrow we will put our hands on a specific problem and, uh, and see how it uh, plays out. Okay, any question? Oh, so far so good. There's a lot of, lot to process, but uh, hopefully tomorrow the example will make it clear. All right, uh, then uh, I think we're done here. Stop sharing and I'll stop recording.